Hi, and welcome back to Shared Services and Outsourcing Week Doc. My name is Naomi Secor, Global Head of the Shared Services and Outsourcing Network, and I'm so excited to be hosting this session, sponsored by our good friends at Radius. why most GBS leaders are late to the OTC party. And we shouldn't be. According to SSOM's 2021 Industry Survey and Report, order to cash falls within the top five services provided in Shared Services and GBS. And as a result, cash management and optimization have become a priority. Everything that touches and impacts cash is now on the table, so this is a truly timely topic. Just before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items. There are several pieces of additional content provided by High Radius available to you in the Resource Center, including a link to their GBS Masterminds podcast series and several Order the Cash ebooks and a paper on autonomous receivables. We want your questions, so please refer to the Q&A tab at the bottom of the console, add your questions, and we're going to get them towards the end of the presentation. And I've also placed our speakers' bios and contact information right on the console so that you can easily connect with them. And so let's get started. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Stefan glissman Bringman, who's the Director of Digital Transformation at iRadius. He's an experienced business and product development expert, 25 years history working in IT and services industry. And we have Sarah Sturr, who's the Director of Digital Transformation at iRadius, 20 plus years working in and around for the finance function, and she's passionate about finance transformation of any kind, with the aim to get the CFO and process owners back into the driver's seat of proactivity. So welcome, and let's get going. Thank you so much, Naomi. And uh, yes, uh, we're very excited to welcome everyone to this session. Um, we will talk you through what the order to cash party that we're talking about is exactly about. And we will determine who is missing and still, since when. Uh, we will also talk how much fun it would be once you join the party. And don't worry, we will also go through why you kept everyone at the party waiting. Um, and what to do next after this session finishes. Um, Naomi has run our introductions uh, beautifully already, um, so you know who to hunt down uh, for questions at the end of the session or later on uh, as well. Of course, we will share our, our contact details as well. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Naomi. Uh, I'm Stefan, and uh, the main question is, Sarah, how about this order to cash party now? Yes, it was me who promised, didn't I? So we log into what the party is about. Let's just jump straight in. We will determine what we should be looking at by going through some views on uh, trends. Naomi has already mentioned the SSON uh, survey, uh, which is aptly titled The Future of GBS is Digital. Um, now, I want to unpick that statement a little bit. While I agree, um, I want to make clear what, what we mean by digital um, and also look into the future a bit. So digital, um, in what Stefan and I will talk about today, it's not just using ERP system. It doesn't just mean automation, using rules-based RPA. We understand digital to be, and we'll talk about that, as AI and machine learning for the order to cash process. Um, also, I want to just make very clear, digital just doesn't mean that the human is not involved anymore. It's just that the digital enablement empowers the human workforce to focus on high value activities and decision making. The other end of that statement, the future of GBS is digital. I don't agree with that quite yet because yes, the future is, but today should be as well. And that's why we're saying um, there is an order to cash party uh, going on digitally and some people might be late. So um, these two things laid out uh, as they are, let's look into um, what McKinsey, Gartner, and in a little bit more detail, um, what SSON um, have to tell us uh, on the trends. Yeah, let's start with the McKinsey survey from uh, 2021. First of all, this survey is good news. So compared to their former 2017 survey, uh, we've seen, let's say in 2017, 48% of the respondents ranked scaling down costs as one of their top three priorities. It's the big bar in black, whereas now, so four years later, the figure is down to 10%. This is a very strong shift. So it's uh, really decreased by 80%. So and pandemic yes. for sure has been a driver for that state of uh, change of mind, right? 
Yes, and moving away from the cost savings focus, for me, it's more important, where has it actually moved to? And you can see that with the 38 and 19 percent, just under 60 percent of business seek to realize a competitive advantage out of um, digital uh, enablement and technology use. Um, and some of them really want to focus the whole business uh, around that digital technology and move their strategy along to that. For me, having worked in the finance function um, for a long time and in finance change, this is really exciting. Because what I've been hearing is that all the fun stuff, all the snazzy apps, that's just for front office. But now finally, the message has sunk in that it's not user experience is not just end customer experience. It's also employee experience and using digital enablement and snazzy apps for internal processes. Yeah, let's continue with, uh, with the Gartner study. It's one of my favorites. So the top strategic technology trends for 2022. And uh, the Gartner study really starts with the words, CEOs want three things, growth, digitalization, and efficiency. The question is, which top strategic trends will help to meet these uh, priorities of the CEOs? And Gartner lists 12 trends in three groups of four uh, for 2022 that build on and reinforce one another. The first four trends engineer yeah, trust, so data fabric, cybersecurity mesh, privacy enhancing computation, and cloud native platforms. The next four trends help to scout change and enable to scale digitalization effort. Uh, so we will focus on hyper automation, which was already part of the last years. Uh, yeah, they had nine top trends uh, in a minute. Uh, and the last group um, helps accelerating growth. So for example, like uh, Sarah just mentioned, total experience, so customer experience, user and employee experience, or short, just multi-experience. And we picked autonomic systems to explain and dive deeper into that in a minute. Yes, so this is um, on the surface level, the, the SSON survey graph here that we use um, looks a little bit more complex. So let me guide your eye um, as you are used to with the four fields uh, matrixes, the fun stuff happens up in the top right. Um, so if you look at that, the top right shows where low current capability in GBS processes meets up with high future relevance. So this is where the sh party should be happening and the GBS leads might be laid to that. What you can see here, all those dark blue dots, these are the three elements that the survey mentions of technology enablement, which was one of the overall five uh, trends that they're looking at. You can see those in the legends. Um, but all three of them, where other topics are more distributed across the quadrant, um, all three of them are in that high need for action bucket, where current capability is really rather low. But looking into the future, it's really relevant that you have that capability. So to join the party, put on your coat, grab a bottle of wine, and just wait for us to finish this session, and then you can join the party. Now, this one uh, will be a familiar look to most of you. Um, it's a Gartner hype cycle. With a hype cycle, Gartner visually represents the development path of new technology applications and innovations through time. It's mapped against the level of expectations that people have towards it at different points in time with that notable peak of inflated expectations giving the hype cycle its name. Now, each technology over time moves from the left. It starts from the left in time, and it moves towards the right. Now, technologies or other innovations can move through the hype cycle at different speeds, and some might even drop off the curve altogether because they become obsolete or non-relevant before they reach um, a plateau of productivity, for example. Um, and now looking at why are we looking at a hype cycle, right? That's the interesting question. We're looking at a hype cycle because it shows you that there are two points in this time in a technology where it's most likely that you hear about the technology because everyone is talking about it. So let's take the example of machine learning. You will have already have heard about machine learning a while back when it was at the peak of inflated expectations. 
at which point you would have said it's too early. That's just a first movers um, move. Uh, it's not bang on down our strategy. We, it's not going to live up to expectations. We don't have to invest in machine learning. Well, the next time you hear about the machine learning more would be when it reached uh, the plateau of productivity, because then everyone is using it, at which point it would be too late for you to invest then to take a competitive advantage out of using it. So we're talking about it right now, where it's past the peak already, and you can see by the color coding that Gartner expects machine learning to reach the plateau of productivity in two to five years. So this gives you um, the time frame you have to use machine learning in the order to cash processes and realize the most benefit as it's not yet used by everyone and in every place. Um, Stefan, I think you had a, word, a few words about machine learning um, regarding order to cash here as well. Yeah, it's um, there is a reason for focusing on machine learning. It's, it's uh, regarding adopting AI-powered software as a service solution has now been possible for several years. So, and uh, it's exactly this technology that could enhance your processes and KPIs like working capital, DSO, and so on. And uh, AI will also be a key to transform you know, reactive task and maybe even entire processes into proactive order to cash activities. Um, so that, that's the reason why we are focusing on that. And um, yeah, I think we have a poll ready um, to ask our audience to, Sarah, right? Yes, just a very, very quick one. So the question to answer is, what is your AI maturity level in the order to cash space? And you will see four buttons that you can choose between. So one is awareness. You should click that button if you have conversations about AI when it comes to your order to cash processes, but nothing more has really happened yet. You can go to level two as active. If you already run proofs of concept, you maybe have a pilot project running um, to understand more what it can do for your business. Um, if you have at least one AI project moved to full production, you please click operational. And if you're really experienced and in any new digital project, you consider AI and machine learning, you click systemic and then you hit the submit button. So we will give you a few seconds um, until we reveal the poll. Yeah, let's see if it's uh, what we expect to see or if it's different, depending on the audience, right? <laughs> yeah, I hope everyone is ready. I will reveal the results three, two, one now. Let's see what we have. So we see awareness is leading with 50%, active has a third, and we have a few one in systemic. So I'm excited to speak to you later. Let's see yeah. what we have here. So this is what we expected to see. Exactly. So um, because our experience with clients and prospect uh, in order to cash is that we see an 80-20 split, which is a quite common split, by the way. So 80% on level one or two. But in this case, at least yeah, 50% are experimenting already with AI. This is a little bit more than in our audience today because I think we got two thirds, around about 66% in the first two level, on the first two level, which means there are more than our 20% that we see in the levels three to five. Because um, on operational level, we see around about yeah, 15% already um, having something in production. And uh, yeah, the last 5%, um, and then, there are only just a few, so one in thousand, or how we call it, dot one, uh, uh, on transactional level. Meaning, this is something we didn't ask at all. Or uh, if someone is already on transactional level, this means really the entire business is completely digitally transformed into this, yeah, new approach, right? Um, so, yeah, surprising, um, but maybe not that big surprise. I think so. In general, we are fine, and some are maybe even more on level three than we thought. So I yeah, think so um, we want to yeah, dive deeper into AI maturity, yeah, right? Yes, exactly. So let's see what the uh, maturity that we just talked about and that um, you kindly ta taken part in our poll, what does that mean for order to cash? 
Yeah. And I like to start with automation, or better, uh, like Gartner calls it, hyper-automation. By the way, hyper-automation, I think I mentioned that before, has already been one of the top nine technology trends for 2021. Um, so let me explain what is meant by hyper-automation. Hyper-automation is a business-driven approach to identify, vet, and automate as many business and IT processes as possible by an orchestrated use of multiplier technologies, tools, platforms, and so on. And if you split these kind of yeah, automation or the path to automation into three steps, the first step is task automation. It's quite simple automation by, I think Sarah mentioned it in the beginning, by rules, and RPA is the well-known buzzword for that. Um, whereas step two is about process automation. So it's um, more complex, of course, and it will impact entire processes, whereas the first step is just based on a yeah, single task. And the last step, step three here towards to, hyper-automation, this is a real game changer because um, you need autonomous software tools that can morph through data or through usage by data over time. So it's an advanced machine learning um, um, method that uh, it will use. And yeah, I think Sarah will take a closer look into autonomous software now. So Sarah, it's your stage. <laughs> yeah, it's um, so if you think about, um, and this applies to order to cash as well, if we take a little bit of a step back and look through time before we land on the autonomous software, what we see is that we jump from a mainframe to on-premise uh, solutions, to cloud software, which has been around for quite a few years. But all those jumps, as big as they have been, if you look from mainframe to, to cloud software, um, but they have been about processing data. They have been about how do you process data, how much power you have at your disposal to process it, where the data is held, and how the data can be accessed and from where the data can be accessed. But now the jump to the fourth generation to autonomous software, for me it's special because the software is still processing data, like everything else has done before, we're still processing data. But at the same time, the software, it's changing how it processes the data and it evolves while doing so, which obviously means um, that's what machine learning means. Looking, um, zooming in a little bit here on HiRadius. So HiRadius provides software as a service to the office of the CFO across processes, as you will see, like treasury, record to report, and of course, order to cash, and we are the market leader in that space. Now, our solutions have evolved in the similar way, of course, um, as all the technology has evolved from on-premise to cloud using AI and then jumping to autonomous software. Now, what you can see here is that since 2019, we have been successfully providing autonomous software solutions in the order to cash space, which is why we're saying the party has already started. Now, still, we're still on a higher level. We've shown you that now, high radius, we can do order to cash autonomous software. But what does that really mean? What does it mean for your processes? What does it mean on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, as Sarah mentioned before, High Radius offers autonomous software for the office of the CFO. So in this case, we like to take a look at the order to cash part. And I like to introduce two machine learning use cases from the credit process. So an early process within order to cash, blocked order management to be precise. Um, the first one will be how machine learning can help to recommend how to release an already blocked order. And the second one will show how machine learning can even predict upcoming blocked orders. So let's start with the first one, um, blocked order management. And um, so how to deal with blocked orders? On the left-hand side, we see three options. First option, release manually. This is, by the way, the most common procedure. Uh, second one, um, mix between green and orange, use AI to recommend best action and then release manually. Or, and that's the third uh, option in green, fully automated management of blocked order. 
if an order gets blocked, companies are facing the risk of revenue loss. So that's why blocked order management is a high priority task in the credit process. Uh, main reason for blocked orders, of course, is in, insufficient credit limit. And the reason for that might be late payment, so something uh, from the risk side and or a high order volume, so something from the demand side, or even both in combination. Sometimes you have other reasons for a blocked order, like you have problems with the delivery, so problems from the uh, supply chain uh, side. So in this example, on this example on the right-hand side, we have a credit exposure of 8K euro, that's the one in orange, the bar, a credit limit of 10K euro, that's uh, represented by the red line, and therefore an order of, uh, in this case, 7K euro was blocked in blue, um, so what, what happens here, so based on a fresh risk assessment, the best action is to increase the credit limit to 15K euro and release the order. As said before, most common is the manual release of a blocked order. This is done by gathering all the information about the cost, like I mentioned, the credit limit, open invoices, are there any disputes, deductions, and then deciding if the credit limit can be increased or if not, if you... Yeah, ask for an, uh, an additional payment, um, maybe additional securities. And uh, of course, this will take some time. So quite often, if sales is pressuring uh, enough, the order will just be released without any further action. That's faster, but maybe not always in the interest of the company. So AI can help to suggest if and how a blocked order should be released. So based on historical and actual experience uh, experience patterns, for example, payments, orders, and so on, machine learning can really recommend what further action to be taken. For example, increase the credit limit temporarily or permanently, or request payment or securities. Now, the still manual decision can be taken much faster. Um, so that's um, the, the path in the middle, or within agreed boundaries, for example, for low-risk customers, and uh, yeah, within, let's say, a maximum um, temporary limit increase, this could be done fully autonomic uh, by AI. But this will be still reactive, and you can do even better than that. And I will show that within the next, next example. So the next example is about prediction. And the, because the best way to deal with blocked orders is to avoid them in the first place by predicting and preventing a blocked order. Uh, in the example on the right-hand side, we have the same situation as before, so 10K euro credit limit, that's represented by the red line, 8K euro um, credit exposure in solid orange, but the AI, in this case, predicts, it's not fact, it just predicts a payment of 2K euro for the next day, that's the hatched green uh, bar, and a 7K, order, uh, 7K euro order for the day after, that's the hatched one in blue. The order would get blocked, but now AI can perform an automated action to, in example, temporarily increase the credit limit to 13K euro for the next three days. So when the predicted payment and the order really happen, the order won't get blocked. So the question is, how can machine learning predict ne next payments? So dates and amounts, next orders, again, dates and volume or amount on a daily basis. Machine learning has to be trained with historical data from the last two years. An example, yeah, open and closed AR uh, uh, information, open and closed payment commitments, historical status changes for orders, credit check summaries for all the orders, historical changes of credit limit and risk class, and the current credit limit and exposure snapshot for all accounts. But this is not enough. Um, it will also take into account for the daily prediction of payments and orders, uh, actual life data. So um, accounts receivables data, open, closed, and closed invoices, payment commitment data, again, opened and closed ones, credit extracts, and all orders, including the blocked ones. And run through this process again and again to, in the end, improve the quality of the prediction over time. This is a really proactive management of blocked orders. And the question, you know, it's not a question. So how cool is that, right, Sarah? <laughs> I think it's really cool. And um, I appreciate that we only show you a very, very small example of a part of the order to cash process 
and the whole order to cash process. We'll have many more of those examples. Um, so that is really cool because it's not just blocked order management. It's a lot of parts of the order to cash process where solutions like this um, are out there today, are used successfully by our customers. Um, and Stefan and I, thinking how cool is that, we collated the top five excuses that we hear for showing up late to this party. Yeah, um, let's take a look at the most heard ex excuses, sorry, reasons for why don't you consider or implement AI-powered order to cash solution. And the first one, it, it's a typical one, really. I'm good um, because we have everything we need. And as we are most in the, of the time see, you're probably not right. You're not good. But um, yeah, we have some more, right? <laughs> We do, and this one is my favorite. Um, at the top four, I'm waiting for my ERP migration because it's such a big project. This will give you probably an excuse for a very long time, really. Truth is, though, as we are talking about software as a service here, it's ERP agnostic. Looking at our products, they still connect with any ERP, and in fact, with a lot of other systems across the order to cash cycle, uh, like banking systems, information agencies, etc. So. In a relatively short time, you can start using autonomous software for your order to cash process. You get a better process. And then while your ERP migration happens, basically from maybe an ERP on-premise to, to the cloud, your process in um, the autonomous uh, software solution and using the AI and using that platform, that won't even have to change. So you can do it in parallel. Yeah, I think the third one, um, let's see where we have it. The, we, the third one we, we quite often hear is really, we don't have AI experts. So we don't have IT finance or order to cash resources who are AI experts. This is not surprising. Uh, most of the companies don't have that, uh, maybe within IT, but really it's not needed. Uh, you, you don't really need to have AI expert because it's part of the solution already. So it does not have to be um, developed anyhow. It's already um, up there and just waiting for the right data. That's it. <laughs> so uh, everyone, no, I think we have a, the number two. I think this is with you, Sarah, right? Yeah, it is. It's it, This one is actually a tough one, and that's why it takes the number two spot. Uh, we don't have budget, probably because your budget is bound up in that ERP migration that I talked about uh, just a bit earlier, um, and you have spent your budget or overspent potentially. Um, but it is worth looking, as despite obviously budget has to be there. Um, it is a tough one, but it's worth looking into because the return on investment we usually see um, comes back in under 18 months, and I would say in 50% of our clients, it comes back in under a year. Now, Stefan, I think number one is yours. There we go. Yeah, I think everyone is waiting for that. And it looks funny, <laughs> but it, actually it isn't. Uh, the most hard excuse is really, we are too busy. And our short and crisp answer to that is, you are doomed anyway. Um, because you you should not be too busy to think about how you can improve your processes, how you can do uh, this path or how you can work on this path uh, on digital uh, uh, transformation. It's a must have. So you can't be too busy for that. That's the reason why we said, um, yeah, we can't accept that as, a, as an excuse um, because it's just an excuse. So um, yeah, the question is now, Sarah. <laughs> yes. So we, ev everyone here is now sitting with their coats on and that bottle of wine still gripping that. So what do we send them to do now, Stefan? Yeah, I think we collected three, let's say, takeaways. Um, so first one is um, that there are many more important benefits from technology than just saving costs. Uh, so you can grow your cap uh, competitive advantage or at least uh, keep up with the competition, right? So that's the first bullet point here. Second is with you, Sarah. Yeah, it's please, please do clarify on your hurdles and the things that you think are holding you back. Do revisit them. Give us a call. Um, and let's see what really is a constraint um, and what actually doesn't require a waiting list here. 
Yeah, and the third one, I think I think I um, mentioned that before. Seek technology as enablers on your path to hyper automation and multi experience, for example. Not just um, customer experience, but also uh, employee or user experience. And I think the conclusion is with you, Sarah. Yeah, so it's it's me again and talking about the party and then the cocktails that are getting warm. Um, I think well, we told you off at the beginning, you're late to the order to cash party, but we also told you it's not too late to join now. So that two to five year plateau to productivity that we talked about in the hype cycle, we can let you off with being fashionably late rather than being too late. And I think that's it. Naomi, do you want to close the session there? Uh, yes. Yeah, do we have any question? There is one question that came in. Yes. yes. A couple questions. We have time for one question. And so um, how long does it take from decision to use AI in order to cash to an up and running AI powered process? I think we have the standard answer to that, um, <laughs> like lawyers do. It depends. Um, it depends actually on quite a lot of things. Um, first of all, wh where are you starting from? How good are you prepared? But I would say in general, um, something between six to 12 months is realistic um, if you're not yeah, too worse with your starting point, right? Sarah, would you agree? Yeah, and no one, no one is worse with a starting point. Let's let's just be kind for the for the answer to the question <laughs> after we've told everyone off uh, with the session there. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us today, and um, yeah, let's go from there. Perfect. Yeah. So, All right, thank you very much. Presentation, and I do encourage everybody to connect with our speakers and pick up those assets before you leave today. It was a wonderful day at Shared Services and Outsourcing with Doc, and we'll see you tomorrow morning for our first session starting at 10 a.m. Bye-bye now. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.